Hello everyone. Welcome back to the fuzzing book and welcome to our new chapter on automated testing of graphical user interfaces. So what is this all about? Let me take you directly to my favorite program in here. And my favorite program today is a web browser. Is there something special about this web browser? Well, nothing too special actually here. You have an address bar and other stuff, so nothing really exciting in here. But this web browser actually is special because I can take this web browser and <clears throat> fully automate its execution. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to surf to web page. And here you see the web server for fuzzing book swag that we already have seen in the previous chapter on web fuzzing. And now I'm going to have some fun and generate test cases for this web server automatically by fuzzing through the browser. So let me see whether we can actually get this done. So here we are. We're happily clicking along and happily typing along, typing into the fields, clicking through the individual elements, all of this being generated by our browser. Oh, sorry, all of this being generated by our fuzzer in here. Our fuzzer automatically generates keystrokes that go, fill out forms, and automatically explore an entire site. Here we are at the fuzzing book site, and the <clears throat> A fuzzer is now going and exploring the entire fuzzing book site, one page after another, going through menus and all, in order to find out more forms where it can fuzz the input. Unfortunately, on the fuzzing book site, there are not that many forms. Well, we don't collect uh, any form data from you, as far as I recall, but it is happy to go through all the individual chapters and try things out. Here we are. It's done already. So what is this fuzzer that can automatically generate inputs for a web browser or more generally for graphical user interfaces? We jump right into the chapter of uh, testing graphical user interfaces and we're going to take a look behind the scenes how our GUI fuzzer, because that's the class we are defining here in this chapter, actually manages to do all that. The central idea here is to use a framework for automated GUI interaction, which is called Selenium. And Selenium is a framework that allows you to remote control a browser, get access to all the elements on a user interface, and then interact with these user interface elements all programmatically. Selenium is not only available for web browsers, as we have it in here, but it's also available for other user interfaces just as well. And you can use it in a very similar fashion. In here, we use it for our web server that we already have encountered in the last chapter. So what I'm doing now is, so I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm going to start a so-called web driver, which is the interface between the program and the browser at hand. I'm creating a GUI driver here, which allows us to access our browser and we <clears throat> can run it in headless mode, which means we don't see the screen, or we can run it without headless mode, which means that we can see the screen. <clears throat> if you want to try this out yourself on your local notebook, then try setting headless to false, and then you're going to see the web browser working just as we had before but you can also go into the notebook and take screenshots, again, programmatically from the web browser. So <clears throat> let us start a new web browser and have some fun here. So I, um, I just um, invoked the execution. So everything is now ready and I can now create a web browser. So what's going to happen right now is that we actually start a new instance of Firefox that shows up uh, <clears throat> that shows up somewhere on my screen. I'm going to switch over to the other screen so that we can actually see it. So let me get an empty screen here. 
And let me paste this down here. Here we go. Wonderful. This is the web browser that we have just seen before. And this is what we want to automate. So, and with this, we can now interact by using this GUI driver inter uh, interaction, well, interaction link that creates a link between our Python program via Selenium and the remotely controlled browser. So I can have it go to a particular URL. And you will see that in here, we actually have entered the URL as defined in our text. So going to the fuzzing book server, swag server, which we are also running in here. And well, we can also look at the log messages again, as in the chapter on web testing. And we can also take screenshots while the browser is running. And if you don't believe that this actually is a screenshot, let me type something in here into that, br into that browser. So I'm just typing here, hello world. Well, doesn't, not, not particularly creative as a name, but let's go for this. And if I now go and take a screenshot here in my notebook, then the screenshot is actually going to include the hello world thing in here. There's plenty of books on how to interact with a particular program in a particular version on a particular platform. And these books are filled with screenshots from the very beginning. And the way these books are written is by authors taking all these screenshots one after the other, interacting, take a screenshot, interacting, take a screenshot, pasting all of this together in a big Word file or whatever, and then creating the book out of it. And every time the program is updated, you have to do this again. Well, you know, with Selenium, you can actually do all of this automatically. You just have the a script that interacts with your browser or your user interface and then create screenshots and then everything happens automatically. So I'm going to clear that out in here from, from our remotely controlled web browser because we're going to fill this now programmatically just as well. Let's just see the screenshot now is actually empty. That's great. Wonderful. So how does one fill out forms with that? Um, <clears throat> every UI element in on, sorry, every UI element in Selenium also is an individual entity, which we can find on the user interface through a variety of methods. Notably uh, for web browsers, we can find them by name. So if we know that there is a particular element whose name is name, we can find it. We could also search it by the text that is being displayed, although that is not uh, recommended because the text that is being displayed could actually change, notably if you translate an application to another language. So let's go by the internal identifiers, makes things a bit easier. And once we have such an element, we can interact with it. A uh, name is actually the form field in which we enter our name. So this accepts a text. And for this, we can send individual keys to it. So let's go and send a couple of keys to it. Let's name it Jane Doe. And now we have Jane Doe entered into our field. We can actually do this again. And then we're going to have Jane Doe twice in here. So it's not setting the text. It's simply simulating the keystrokes in here. Let's go and take this second Jane Doe off here. And we can kind of again take a screenshot and we see that we have <clears throat> Jane Doe in here. And um, now we can go and write further programs and enter more elements in here. And now we have Jane Doe in Seattle, I have our entire form filled out. And um, the checkbox for terms and conditions is not filled out yet. Uh, no, it's not. So we're also going to do that. We extract the terms and conditions field and we click on it. We invoke the click method. And now <clears throat> we have everything filled out. Next thing what we do is we press the submit button. Here we go, press the submit button. What are we going to see now? Surprise, surprise. We get the actual message. Thank you for your fuzzing book order. And now we can take again, um, take a screenshot and see whether everything worked, everything worked well. So if you are, again, if you're running this locally, you can open the browser by setting the headless variable to false and running the notebook, and then you'll be getting that. If you are running this within the MyBinder service, then you cannot do this because MyBinder does not allow you to run your own web browser. 
then you leave headless as it is, but you can always get screenshots of the browser as it is running. It's amazing. So you have the server running on a remote machine, you have the browser running on a remote machine, you have your Jupyter running, and all of them play well together. Ah, never ceases to amaze me, all of that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we can also go back and go back to the previous form. Here we go, and we go back to our form as it was filled out. So, and um, we can do more. We can query elements of a particular type and find out where individual elements point to. We can also click on them and we then get the terms and conditions in here and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, simply navigating through the entire page. One important thing, and this is actually the main use case for Selenium, is to write your own automated test cases. I'm not talking about generating test cases. We'll come to that later. I'm talking about simply writing test cases that you can run automatically. And such a test case, here we have one, would go and fill out, say, a form, interact with the program in question. What we're doing in here is we are filling, we are finding out individual elements and we're sending keys and we're clicking on things. Here you have some uh, Walter White in our case series who wants to order some Fuzzing Book swag. Actually, I'm surprised. I know Walter White would rather, uh, would rather order some uh, chemical stuff, but let's assume he's a fan of Fuzzing Book. So far, so good. And then we send all of this to our, to our site. And once we have done that, we actually query the current status of the user interface and check whether everything has worked as we intended. So what we do here is we check whether we, whether we have a nice thank you message. <clears throat> we also check that we do have a confirmation and we also check that the confirmation actually contains the name, the email, the city and the zip code, which are all features of our fuzzing book web server. So, and we can run this on our driver. And if we do this, well, first thing, good news, the test succeeds. And the second news is, well, we can still look up the, we can still look up the, our web server in here and we see that our order for a Fuzzing Book t-shirt has been successful. We can actually repeat this again and again and then Walter White is going to get plenty of t-shirts. Ah, finally. Okay, <clears throat> and this is how you, as a regular web developer, would go and automate the task of testing web pages, testing user interfaces by writing such automated scripts, running them. And of course, well, every time you make a change, say to the web server, and you want to make sure that the web server is still operating normally, you can just rerun all these tests, all these manually written tests, and make sure that nothing uh, is broken in there. You can even do so during, um, during production meaning that while the web server is running, you can check whether things work just as fine, always have your tests running in the background, quite a number of possibilities in here. Okay, so this means continuous testing, this means checking of arguments and checking of results, all fine, but somebody has to write all these test cases, of course. Now, the news is that such exploration of a user interface as well as, <coughs> as well as filling in forms can also be done automatically by, you guess it, fuzzing. Just as we have fuzzed the web server in the previous chapter by sending URLs, we can also fuzz a user interface by sending keystrokes and clicks and other interaction elements to the right places in the user interface and thereby actually fully automatically fuzz even complex user interfaces. How does this work? Let's take a brief look at the remainder of the chapter. First thing we do is we need to figure out how to interact with the user interface. For this what we need is we need a listing of the actual elements on a UI that we can interact with. And uh, what we can do, for instance, we can find elements by a particular tag name. So uh, we can find out all 
HTML input elements, for instance. Input elements are the ones where you enter a text. And this is something which we can then print out for the fun of it. So we have a name element of type text and we have an email element of type email and a city element of type text and so on. And we can even, we can even find out which current texts are being entered here. Um, let me demo that here. So let's see which UI elements do we have right now. I don't think we have too many UI elements. No, at this moment we have zero UI elements because we are on the thank you page. So let's go one page back. Here we are back again at our at our um, here we are back again at our order form. Let's again go and find all elements by input. Here we go, and um, now we can actually print out all these elements, and we find that we have a name, email, set. Oh, the text is still the same. I would have thought that the text now actually contains the elements that we've seen. That's just the te that, that's not the text that is being entered. That's just the text that is associated with the element, which is not very much. Um, but here, if we go deeper into, if we actually now retrieve all the tag elements, the A elements, the anchor elements on the web page, then we can actually find the text that is associated with them, namely the terms and conditions for the link that we have at the very bottom of the page. Okay, so, so we now know how to get all input elements, that is all form elements, we know how to get all links on a page and we can also retrieve the content of that link. So we know the text of the link. And um, we can, in a similar vein, also retrieve all the individual checkboxes. And now we are defining a set of actions that we can actually apply on this user interface. We have a fill action that takes an element and fills it with a particular text. We have a check action that sets a UI checkbox to a particular value of true or false. We have a submit action that clicks on the submit button. And we have a click uh, action that clicks on a UI element with a given name, typically in order to follow a link. And this is the sequence of actions that we would need in order to fill out the order form. And this is just a minor set of actions. I mean, you can also have more actions, uh, double click, uh, right click, uh, swipes, uh, extra modifier keys, shift, click, shift, drags, shift, triple click, command, option, control, shift, caps lock, escape, double, triple, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, you can define all of these in Selenium. Uh, we're not going to need these for our web page, but well, if you're testing an ego shooter, maybe you're going to need, not sure whether Selenium is the best tool for 3D games, but yep, if, there, if, you have any, if you have any particular super action, yes, you can do that. Control Alt Delete would be a perfect thing. So we're having these very simple actions in here, and now we want to be able to extract such actions from the website, and we also want to be able to synthesize and run such actions. First thing we do is we build some um, code in, that retrieves such actions. And for this, well, it's not very complicated. We mine all the input elements, we mine all the button elements. And for each of these elements, we set an appropriate action. Uh, this is a bit boring, but here we go. And um, these are the actions that we can actually that we can actually do. We can check terms, we can fill the city, we can fill the email, we can fill the name, we can fill the zip, and we can submit. And you see here already that we do have placeholders, placeholders for the actual values to be filled in. These will later be filled in by our fuzzer. And if these things look actually like non-terminals to you, that is because we will be using a grammar for this very purpose. Okay, so now this was for inputs. We can do similar things for uh, we can do similar things for buttons and we can do similar things for links. And now we get all the information in. We can get all the information out of our program. And uh, for our current uh, website, this is indeed the set of actions that we get. So we're having a call, we're having a class called GUI Grammar Miner. And GUI, the GUI Grammar Miner actually extracts the current set of states from the, extracts the current set of states from the current web page. Okay, so <clears throat> this is <clears throat> this is how we can extract all the individual 
all the individual actions from a site. Now let's go a bit further and let's go and find out how we can actually go and explore all of the user interface because we not only want to click on individual elements, we not only look at individual pages, we want to see as many pages as possible. And for this, we go and represent the user interface as a state machine. A state meaning the set of user interface elements that you can see. And from each state, we can navigate to the next state by clicking on individual user interface elements. Think of this, think of the states as web pages where you can go from one user interface state to the next one. And um, here's an example of what this could possibly look like. We do have our start state, which is not very interesting. And we have the order form. This is how we start. And from the order form, we can go to terms and conditions, and then we end with on the page of terms and conditions. On this page, we can go back to the order form, or we can go and fill things. And if we fill things, then we get to the thank, thank you page. And from the thank you page, we can then again go back again to the order form. So this is a finite state machine that shows us all the individual states and the possible transitions between them. And the idea now is twofold. A, we want to mine such a state machine, and B, we want to integrate or embed such a state machine into a grammar such that each <coughs> output of the grammar actually allows us to traverse the state machine and at the same time also fill in elements from <coughs> uh, the forms that we are seeing. So you can think of us actually traversing this graph by covering all the individual states and edges. And while we are going from one state to the next, we're actually executing these individual actions that are attached to each of these transitions. And by going for more and more actions, more and more actions, more and more actions, eventually we can explore the entire user interface. Okay, <clears throat> and for this we use and embed the finite state machine in a grammar, as already announced. Um, here's an example of what this looks like. Our start state, every state becomes a non-terminal, is the order form. And in the order form, what we can do is we can click on terms and conditions, then we get to a new state, or we fill stuff and then we click on submit. And then we are in the thank you state where more actions can be done. And in the thank you state, uh, we can click on the order form and then we end up in the order form. And every expansion of this grammar becomes a sequence of actions that gets us through the entire thing. So we do have some, um, and we have some code here that actually go and retrieves these state grammars. I'm going to skip that, but we are having an entire grammar here that allows us to express that. And there's an, an individual class called the GUI grammar miner, which actually goes through the entire, that actually goes through the entire website, follows all links in order to access further states and systematically therefore crawls an entire website. And uh, here's an example of an, here's an example of a GUI grammar miner in action. We again apply this on our current GUI driver, and what we get here is an entire grammar that actually represents, well, for one thing, all the individual um, all the individual rules for the individual input elements that we're having. So for instance, what is a string? A string is a sequence of characters um, and like things. Here, come, here comes a list of all characters. A number is a sequence of digits, so that, that's not too exciting. The interesting thing is what the state is, and we do have a sequence of state. The first state is we can click on terms and conditions, and then we end in a new state called state one. Or we can fill out the name and the terms and the city, and then we end in state two. Notice how the individual actions are all separated by new lines. We'll be later adding some code that actually allows us to explore these. Now, such a grammar is not necessarily nicely um, not necessarily very readable, so we have a special function called the FSM diagram, which again, uh, <coughs> which again represents such a grammar in a finite state machine form. 
And the current grammar that we're having here is allows us to go into one state. This is the order form state where we can fill in individual parts and then we go to a new state, which we don't know yet because our GUI grammar miner so far has not explored them. Every time our GUI grammar miner, uh, every time a GUI grammar miner goes to a new state, then it adds new states to the grammar, but so far it has only seen the one single state that our current uh, fuzzing book swag web server is in. Okay, so that's all it sees, and, it, we, and we don't know where we're going to end when we hit the submit button. Well, we as humans know, but our, um, but our fuzzer does not yet. And for this we now, uh, in order to get to actually in order to get to more states, we need to be able to fill the forms. We need to be able to execute those user interface actions. Already here, you can see what such a user interface actions look like in the grammar when we're using a grammar fuzzer to expand them. So we fill name with some string. We check terms with some random Boolean value. We fill the city with some random string email, zip likewise. Email actually vaguely looks like an email address and the zip field actually is a sequence of numbers. That's because the input field says that we should put in numbers. And then finally we press the submit button. This is one action as produced by applying a grammar fuzzer on the grammar we just mined. Now we can execute these and in order to execute these, um, we are rather lazy. We <coughs> connect these to appropriate uh, methods in a GUI runner class. We connect the fill action to a do fill a method. Uh, we connect the check um, action to a do check method. And now we can look these up, what these what, what they are actually doing. And that's very simple. Do fill uh, finds the element with the appropriate name and then it sends the appropriate uh, keys. And then it waits a moment for um, actually um, um, uh, one tenth of a second such that the uh, browser and the website, well, if there were any JavaScript and likewise, can actually react to that. Similar things happen for the check action and submit action for the click action. And since we now can go and execute these, here's an example. We run the particular interaction of filling in Walter White, and this is what we get. We get the order form filled with Walter White at the name field. We can now go and actually put these things together. Namely, we can go and uh, take the fuzzer, which is a grammar fuzzer on the state grammar, and we can produce actions on it, on them. Here we go, here's such an action, and we produce actions until we have submit. And we can now run this particular action. And if we run this action of filling out the form with X and city, all these random values again, then we get the full, then we get the full thing here. We believe sending a fuzzing book t-shirt to a random value. So now we have a fuzzer, which produces sequences of actions that actually also that would also allow us to explore the user interface further. And second, we have a runner that actually executes those actions. And now we can go and build a fuzzer out of that, a variant of grammar fuzzer that would not only produce inputs, but also go and mine the actual GUI and mine the GUI again for new UIs that we encounter. And um, yeah, there's quite some there's quite some stuff to it. We identify each and every state through the set of user interactions that are available in that state. So we're having these dot state in here, which tells us the current state that we are in. And we also have a, a list of um, states seen in which we are, in which we keep track of the individual states that we have processed and. Um, what the GUI fuzzer now does is it goes through the individual, it goes through the individual parts of the finite state machine and extends the grammar with, with each new state it sees. So what we have here is 
the current state symbol? Is that something that is that something that we haven't seen so far? Is that not the final state yet? Then we update the state, and each time we update the state, we also update the grammar with it. And this is something we happily do, and we replace symbols. There's quite some engineering machinery in here. <clears throat> what we're doing now is we are we are filling out more and more. We are filling out the order form again and again. And this is how we can fuzz the order form with more and more elements. 3x as name, or i as name, or 0, or 8q as city, whatsoever. Well, random values in here. And the nice thing about the GUI fuzzer is that while it is filling out these forms, it's also exploring all the states. And the interesting question is, how can we make sure it actually explores all the states and it finds all the states? And it turns out that we don't need much for that because we already do have a tool that allows us to automatically cover all states. We have the grammar coverage fuzzer from the earlier chapter on achieving grammar coverage. And the grammar coverage fuzzer, as you may remember, automatically tries to find expansions that cover as many uh, as many alternatives of the grammar as possible. Now our grammar also embeds states. And therefore, if there is a state which we have not seen yet, which we have not explored yet, the grammar coverage fuzzer will automatically generate an input that gets us to the state. Now this is really nice uh, because this actually allows us to systematically explore all states of the current web page. And this is something that we can now do. And at the end, we get a nice grammar that actually contains all the states of our little, of our little, little uh, web server. Um, yep, we have the order state, we can go to the next state, and it does all of this fully automatically. There's a method explore all, and well, what this does, it, it explores everything. Well, exploring everything may take some time on larger websites. Try exploring all on Wikipedia and let's see how long this takes. Fortunately, you can go and set up a maximum number of, um, a maximum number of actions in the explore all methods. And then we apply this not on our own little web server, but actually on the fuzzingbook.org site. And this then goes and uh, and fetches all the different actions on the fuzzing book site and explores them all. Here's the first five, and you will already see that simply going for act for maximum number of five actions from the beginning retrieves you a very very detailed finite state machine, to giving you all the individual clicks and more clicks and more states and more interaction. Up, oh, yep set the max actions to 100, and then you'll be able to actually check out all the individual clicks and all the individual interaction mechanisms as they are found in the fuzzing book. And let us know if you find anything, if you find that clicking on anything results in an error. Yes, I'll be happy to know. And remember then again, that this not only works for, that this not only works for, uh, web interfaces, although Selenium was built for web interfaces, but you can also apply this on other similar interfaces just as well. And this is already all there is. We have seen how to remote control a user interface using Selenium. We have seen how to interact with it. And we have created appropriate fuzzers that automatically explore all of the user interface and fill out all of its form elements and click on all of its links and check and uncheck all the checkboxes, all automatically achieving a full coverage of all user interface elements, as well as of all the alternatives in the grammar. So what is there not to like about the testing of graphical user interfaces? And this again gives you an idea of how powerful fuzzers can be. 
we're not only talking about strings of text, but we can also think of strings of arbitrary symbols, and these strings can actually be user interface interactions, which we can apply, which we can mine, which we can run. And this being able to access not just one source of input, not just strings, but actually being able to create far more complex inputs for far more complex um, interfaces gives you an idea of what modern fuzzers, if they are being built in a systematic fashion, can do. Of course, you can again combine this with elements from the past chapters, say with injecting arbitrary values, injecting SQL commands, testing whether your user interface actually accepts 8-bit characters, what happens if I have a quote in there, what happens if, uh, if um, my internationalization is right to left, what happens if I do have a different browser, does this still work in the same browser, does this render correctly on my mobile browser, does this render correctly on one of my 100 mobile browsers. Yep, these are all things where A, running tests automatically and b even generating tests automatically can help with that i'd like you to try this out for yourself i wish you lots of fun in exploring the funds of remote controlling user interfaces and again generating inputs for it enjoy